All right, well, welcome to the show. Coming up in some states, minorities are receiving preference when it comes to getting life-saving treatment against COVID. Is that legal? We'll talk to the law professor who says no and is suing over it. But first, one of the things the Biden administration has been crowing about most is the number of judges confirmed in his first year as president. Thus far, 41 have been confirmed, the most confirmed judges in a first year administration since John F. Kennedy. But when you read the recent White House releases and the ensuing media coverage, you would know a lot less about the qualifications of the judges and much more about their race, religion, sexual orientation, gender, country of origin. This morning, the White House announced its 13th slate of federal judicial nominees, eight people who seem to be highly qualified, but that's not what appears most important, at least not to whoever wrote the administration's statement naming the new candidates and the media coverage that followed. While the release offers a brief review of each nominee's resume at the bottom, just listed, the focus and headlines are entirely about race, religion, gender, country of origin, etc. The announcement highlights that the nominees include the first Bangladeshi American, the first Latina to serve on the Eastern District of California, a Taiwanese immigrant who will be the second Asian American to serve on the U.S. District Court of Colorado. It's almost nothing about what makes them, quote, extraordinarily qualified, experienced, and devoted to the rule of law and our Constitution, as claimed in the first line of the announcement. At times, they seem to be tying themselves in knots, trying to make a big deal out of why a nominee is unique. In recent months, the White House celebrated nominees like the first openly LGBT woman to serve as a federal district court judge in any state west of the Mississippi. That's a quote. The only active AAPI male judge on the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of New York. And the first federal judge of South Asian descent in Michigan. It hasn't always been like this. It's gotten much worse over time, which makes me think that they've been pressured to highlight identity over quality. When Biden first took office, the White House was more often promoting how nominees' careers qualified them to sit on the federal bench. They highlighted diversity, yeah, but often it was the professional diversity of the nominees, not just where they were born or their skin color. In the past, they highlighted a magistrate judge on the D.C. Superior Court with deep experience in domestic violence and family law issues, or a lawyer for the DOJ with two decades of civil rights experience, including as deputy chief of the appellate section in the Civil Rights Division. In fact, the announcement of Biden's just when his, it was his second slate of nominees made no mention of what made the nominees diverse and focused on their credentials instead. Back then, they led with qualifications like former prosecutor with the Department of Justice's public integrity section, who would be the first Hispanic judge on the Court of Federal Claims. But something changed. And now it's all about identity politics, which is really depressing and I think insulting to a group of people who seem to have earned a spot on the bench. Not surprisingly, the media is lapping it up. USA Today's story today on the new nominees all but ignored their qualifications and focused their reporting entirely on the various ways that the nominees will diversify the judiciary if they're confirmed. That's not just USA Today. NPR, New York Times, Reuters, The Economist have focused their reporting almost entirely on the skin color, sexuality, or country of origin of Biden's judicial nominees rather than their professional qualifications. Now, let me be clear. I think diversity on the federal courts is a noble goal and a legitimate factor to consider when appointing judges. We need it, but it can't be the factor. And these releases have made it feel like they have a checklist of various interest groups that they need to appease rather than a list of those who would be most qualified to serve on the courts, which I think does all of these nominees and the country a grave disservice. Joining me now is Fatima Goss Graves, president and CEO of the National Women's Law Center. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Really appreciate it. All right, so what do you think I'm getting wrong here? You know, I, I think the big thing that you are missing is how important diversity is in shaping um, the sorts of decisions that we get in this country. The nominees that we have seen so far show that there have long been numerous women, numerous people of color, other people from underrepresented backgrounds with really outstanding legal, professional, and educational backgrounds who should have been considered. Yet we went a decade without a single 
single black woman being appointed to the Court of Appeals. And so, so the Biden-Harris administration should be celebrating the fact that they are finding, nominating, and getting confirmed such outstanding and well-qualified judges from many, many diverse backgrounds. And I would say diverse in terms of race and gender, and as you named LGBTQ status, but but also diverse in terms of professional background. It will well, make but, our federal bench stronger. But that's stronger. what I want to ask you about. That, but that's what I want to ask you about, because the releases claim that it's both those things, right? Which is personal and professional backgrounds. And then every, almost every one of them then just gives you a list, not of the professional backgrounds diversity. It's all about this person's gonna be the second person in the country in this particular district who's of this color or this background or this. And I think that is insulting to these people who have developed a reputation and a career and have proven themselves um, in their careers. And they're being reduced, in my view, to a little headline that then the media picks up on and celebrates about how, oh, it's the, you know, the first Bangladeshi American or whatever it is. And, and again, I'm not saying don't consider that, yeah. but I am well, saying I that I think that the administration is not, is not promoting the professional diversity that they claim and that you claim. So I, you know, I've, I've looked at all their releases and the releases talk about their exceptional professional backgrounds. They talk about their time at the Department of Justice. They talk about the fact, for example, that someone like Judge Katanji Brown Jackson yep. uh, was on the district court for eight years, but it is also important that she was the first black woman confirmed to the circuit court in a decade. And so, the path breakers who this administration has named are so, so many. And that's why it probably seems overwhelming. We went a very long period where nearly all of the nominees, especially to the Court of Appeals, were white men, which is alarming given the diversity in this country. You, you read the releases as I did, right, and went through them. And, and I honestly had, had not seen them all until today, uh, which is when I sort of became aware of this. And so I did go through all the 13 of the releases. And you're right that in the early releases, they were focusing both on professional um, diversity and um, identity, et cetera. Now that's not the case. The most recent ones, the last you know, seven of them, are only focusing on, on identity. Do you disagree with me that there is a danger there in minimizing the qualifications of these people and, and them simply, as the media has summarized it, becoming second person of blank, first person of blank in this particular district who uh, is going to be a judge? Well, I guess I just disagree that they're only focusing on identity. They're naming their many Read professional a accomplishments. So they're saying, for example, that Judge Florence Pan, uh, that she was at the Department of Justice, that she was an assistant United States attorney. But the resume, that the was resume. The first API woman to serve on the D.C. Circuit. I think what actually probably is standing out to you and maybe to the media is the fact that there are so many pathbreakers, so many people who actually no. are first, which is it, extraordinary. This is an I, unusual I, I, time to you. have so many judges and so many of those judges be pathbreakers in a single year. I agree with you, and I don't want to minimize that, right? I'm not suggesting it doesn't matter, right? And, and I hope that no one interprets this as me saying it doesn't matter. But it is not true when you read these. Again, I would recommend if anyone has questions, go read them yourselves. Because what they do is they have a page where they have a, basically a media summary of what the, the first this, this will be the first Bangladeshi, this person will be uh, the, the first Latina to serve on the Eastern District of California, this person, and there is nothing in the recent ones apart from what then follows, which are these resumes, right, which summarize what they've done, but there's nothing about what makes them special. And I think well, that, I think you, I think you and I, well, I and think you and I should are. be able to agree. Wait, wait, let me just finish and I promise I'll let you respond. I, I, I think you and I should be able to agree 
that they should be highlighting in their little media summary, not in the resume portions where you got to go through and look through, in this one page that they're trying to get out there, that there should be a combination of professional and personal diversity, which is not in these releases. Your response. Well, what I will tell you is I actually think they have made a major deal of professional diversity because they've made a major deal of the fact that they have nominated so many public defenders, civil rights attorneys, people who come from backgrounds that have historically been underrepresented because of profession among the federal judiciary. But they also are naming, and I think rightly so, that diversity actually enhances legal decision making, that people are shaped by their identities, their background and their personal experiences. That shows up in how they decide and whether or not they relate or not to the people who come before their court. So a more diverse judiciary is going to be a judiciary that is fairer. And we can do that, right? We, we can yep. actually well, be a country that does both because we have so many people who are I, so well qualified of so many races and genders. I agree, we can do both. I wish that the Biden administration would celebrate both more. But uh, Fatima Goss Graves, important conversation, interesting conversation. I really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thanks. Coming up, New York's Attorney General Letitia James going after former President Trump and his family members and associates, releasing information suggesting they were cheating on taxes. But even if her investigation has merit, she's got credibility issues that are getting in the way. What's up next? It is now an all-out battle between New York Attorney General Letitia James, Donald Trump, his kids, and the Trump Organization. And it seems her past comments about the former president are coming back to haunt her. On Tuesday, James filed a motion in New York State Supreme Court to compel testimony from Donald Trump, Don Jr., Ivanka Trump, and various other key members of the Trump Organization. The AG outlined some of her claims, saying, quote, we have uncovered significant evidence that suggests Donald J. Trump and the Trump Organization falsely and fraudulently valued multiple assets and misrepresented those values to financial institutions for economic benefit. The Trumps must comply with our lawful subpoenas for documents and testimony because no one in the country can pick and choose if and how the law applies to them. The Trump Organization swiftly responded with a statement of their own, attacking James. She's defrauded New Yorkers by basing her entire candidacy on a promise to get Trump at all costs without seeing, having seen a shred of evidence and in violation of every conceivable ethical rule. And on that point, they have a point before she was part of any formal investigation. That hardly seems impartial. Here's the thing. Both things may be true. The attorney general may have uncovered serious irregularities in the Trump organization that should be investigated. And those findings could now be tainted by a stated vendetta against Donald Trump prior to taking office. James is basically saying that the former president misstated or objective facts in order to, among other things, secure favorable terms from lenders and get tax breaks. For example, she says that Trump claimed his triplex apartment was three times bigger than it actually was, meaning that the $127 million valuation he gave to the IRS probably should have been closer to $40 million that he used the inflated valuation to essentially avoid paying other taxes. And there are other similar cheats that James accuses the Trump Organization of employing. Okay, the problem is, some of the AG's past comments make it fair to question whether she's got an ax to grind. So the question is, how do you square these two things? What happens now? Joining us now is Dan Alonso, former federal prosecutor, served as chief of the criminal division for the Eastern District of New York, was also the chief district attorney in the Manhattan DA's office. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Appreciate it. All right. So what do you make of all of this and how to resolve it? Well, First of all, on the question of the attorney general's statements before she got elected and even in office, certainly if I were advising her, and it sounds like if you were advising her, uh, we would tell her not to make statements like that. I, I don't think it, it uh, is helpful. And uh, frankly, it does open her up to the kind of charges that are being leveled now. But that's not really the question, right? I mean, these kind of cases are decided by judges and not by people on Twitter. So the the, the question is not, did she make statements that were inadvisable, but 
did those statements really affect what uh, you know what the case is, the evidence? I mean, is it really a case that seems to have been manufactured out of a vendetta, or is it a real case? I think that at the end of the day, she doesn't get kicked off the case. The the Donald Trump loses his federal lawsuit, but I think he might be able to make some hay out of it, you know, in front of a jury, in front of the court. But at the end of the day, I don't think it's going to really work because of all the evidence she has laid out so far showing that but, it's a legitimate investigation. But shouldn't she recuse herself at the least? I mean, you know, they made a motion back in December to get her to recuse. And I get that that's very unusual. And I get that's the last thing she wants to do in the context of this. But it seems to me she messed up. And as a result, you know what? If, if you're right that there's legitimacy behind the investigation, the way she can ensure that it moves forward and that in a case like this, it matters that the public has faith in it. So she recuses herself. She lets someone else take care of it and, you know, let the chips fall where they may. Yeah, well, the reality is that she's got 10 lawyers taking care of it on the case. I get it that she's the boss, uh, but I don't think this rises to recusal. Recusal is usually limited to conflicts of interest that really compromise um, the person's ability to, to do the job. So th I don't think this rises to that. I think it's inadvisable. She shouldn't have said those things. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the, the statement on the campaign trail was frankly dumb, the one that you just showed. Um, I think that perhaps I wouldn't have issued a press release this week, right? It kind of plays into the whole, she's doing this for political reasons. But the press release's content was well, so kind of overwhelming. And remember, she's not filing a lawsuit yet. All she's doing now is justifying with the court that she has a legitimate basis right. to issue subpoenas. And she does. Let me ask you this. Let me, let me take it out of the Trump realm and give you a hypothetical, which yeah. is uh, someone running for attorney general says, I'm going to go after the CEO of, you know, whatever company, Ford Motor Company, um, because they're, let's not use a specific company. I'm going to go after the CEO of blank company because there's been some stuff swirling around, whether there are questions about it. And I'm telling you, I'm going to go after them, even though I haven't seen anything with the case file. You don't think that that CEO, if that person was then charged or even in similar situation, would have a legitimate argument to say, this attorney general has been talking about going after me before they've even seen the case file. Yeah, so there's a difference between a legitimate argument, which that person would have, and a basis to get rid of that attorney general. For one thing, right. totally, it's totally legitimate. We, we do elect our attorney general. So it's legitimate to say, look, I'm going to investigate cases A, B, and C, and I'm not going to investigate cases D, E, and F. And if you don't like that, don't vote for me. So saying you're going to investigate Trump, um, you know, given the allegations that were out in the public, um, that's not problematic. I would be very careful what I said. Um, but, you know, you can't say I'm going to go after the person, right? Because then you really are targeting a person and not facts. But there was so well, much. She what, said that. Yeah, but, she but, said but I'm going to so sue much, Trump. There was so much predication in, in that's a, a lawyer's term for there's enough to go to go with to investigate. I don't think she said she was going to sue him. I think she said she was going to investigate. No. I could, I could defend her. You know, I would fall on my sword I, I, if, I were, I if I were working for her. You know, she shouldn't yeah. have said that. She clearly shouldn't have yeah. said that. But she didn't say for what. Um, and frankly, she yeah. has already sued the Trump Foundation successfully. I mean, they're, yeah. they're, it's, you know, the previous attorney general sued Trump University mm -hmm. successfully. It's not right. like there is, right. this is a crazy thing. It's not like she's saying out of the blue, I'm going to sue Dan Abrams or Dan Alonzo, right? <laughs> but th this, is, this is somebody who has stuff swirling in public. She shouldn't be saying it. But once it is a legitimate matter and a legitimate lawsuit, it, it devolves into the realm of a defense that they can throw out in court, in the realm of public opinion. But I don't think this is enough for her to, for her to get off the case, or, and certainly not to be disqualified by the right. motion. You get the final word. Dan Alonso, thanks for coming on the show. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Time now for our Mediate Moments, where we check in on the day's bias, buzz, and bull in the world of cable news and beyond. Media coverage of the Supreme Court is rarely gossipy, but that changed yesterday when NPR's prominent Supreme Court expert Nina Totenberg reported that Justice Sonia Sotomayor was hearing arguments remotely because of her colleague, Justice Neil Gorsuch. Sotomayor did not feel safe in close proximity to people who were unmasked. Chief Justice John Roberts, understanding that, in some form or other, asked the other justices to mask up. They all did except Gorsuch, who, as it happens, sits next to Sotomayor on the bench. His continued refusal since then has also meant that Sotomayor has not attended the Justice's weekly conference in person. 
Supreme Court justice ignoring the health request of a colleague, not wearing a mask while also deciding on the constitutionality of mandates. It's a great story, a level of drama we don't typically see from within the Supreme Court. We covered it on this show last night with a Supreme Court expert from the Wall Street Journal who found it surprising. He was right to be skeptical, but the progressive side of cable news used it as a tool to beat up on Gorsuch. Justice Neil Gorsuch, again, was the only member to enter the courtroom without a mask. He's also the justice who recently wrote a book decrying the lack of civility in the country. That just seems ridiculous. Can you put a mask on to be Seriously. polite? You, Neil Gorsuch, are both a rotten co-worker, dangerous to be near in a pandemic, and tonight's absolute worst. For decades, Nina Totenberg has been the gold standard of Supreme Court reporting, so it's hardly surprising that so many went with the story. But late in the day, a new report came from Fox News' Shannon Bream, who shot it down. Accurate. A source at the Supreme Court says there's been no blanket admonition or request from Chief Justice Roberts that the other justices begin wearing masks to arguments. The source further stated Justice Sotomayor did not make any such request to Justice Gorsuch. I'm told given that fact, there was also no refusal by Justice Gorsuch. The justices are all vaccinated and boosted, and they do test before taking the bench for arguments. It was Totenberg versus Bream. And this morning, a joint statement from Sotomayor and Gorsuch that read, quote, reporting that Justice Sotomayor asked Justice Gorsuch to wear a mask surprised us. It was false. It is false. While we may sometimes disagree about the law, we are warm colleagues and friends. Now, NPR put out a statement standing by Totenberg's report. And it seemed there was wiggle room because NPR hadn't reported Sotomayor asked Gorsuch to wear a mask, but that Roberts, and remember she said in some form or another, had asked all of them to do so. But then Chief Justice Roberts was the final vote, as he often is. He put out a statement that said, quote, I did not request Justice Gorsuch or any other justice to wear a mask on the bench. Some form or another? Look, it's in the best interest of the court to appear to be aligned, I'm sure. Totenberg's source told her what she reported. She left it a little squishy in there. But I think in the case of NPR versus Fox News, it appears the Supreme Court rules in favor of Fox and Shannon Bream. That's our wrap up of the day's media bias, Buzz and the Bull. Coming up, if you need life-saving COVID treatment, the color of your skin may play a role in whether you get it. Sounds shocking, but it is happening. That's next. It is true, turns out, that former President Donald Trump had something of a point when he said this last week. In fact, in New York State, if you're white, you have to go to the back of the line to get medical help. Well, New York's governor issued a directive that prioritizes, quote, non-whites and Hispanic individuals in the distribution of potentially life-saving COVID-19 treatments. It's true. In December, the FDA granted emergency use approval for antiviral and monoclonal antibody treatments to be taken orally. Health officials say treatments are in short supply due to the supply, the supply chain issues. And New York Governor Kathy Hochul determined that to receive the treatment, people who test positive need to prove an aggravated health risk. One of those factors or risks is being a person of color. Quote, non-white race or Hispanic Latino ethnicity should be considered a risk factor as long-standing systemic health and societal inequities have contributed to an increased risk of severe illness and death from COVID-19. New York is not the first state to prioritize people of color for treatment. So is Utah and Minnesota, though the state removed race as a preferential factor after threats of legal challenges. And now Cornell University law professor William Jacobson is fighting New York's directive, arguing, quote, Directing medical professionals to award or deny medical care based on immutable characteristics such as skin color without regard to the actual condition of the individual who is seeking these antiviral treatments is nothing more than an attempt to establish a racial hierarchy in the provision of life-saving medicine. The state responded to the lawsuit with a statement saying in part, it is important to note that no one in New York is being turned away from life-saving treatment because of their race or any demographic identifier. Now, CDC data does show that black and Hispanics people are about twice as likely to die from COVID-19 and also significantly more likely to be hospitalized than non-Hispanic whites. The trend also impacting younger people 
as of June 2021. 37% of Hispanic deaths were people younger than 65, 30% for blacks, and just 12% for white Americans. So where does that leave us? Well, the professor who filed that lawsuit joins us now, William A. Jacobson, clinical professor of law and director of the Securities Law Clinic at Cornell University. Professor, thank you very much uh, for coming on the show. Appreciate it. All right, why did you decide to file this lawsuit? Well, the standards <clears throat> that the New York State Health Department has issued uh, provide racial preferences without a rational basis for that. The fact that some communities as a group, as a whole, may have higher rates of death does not justify these guidelines. Under these guidelines, if two people walk into the hospital who are the same age, identical health, have COVID symptoms, one, the additional requirement is that you prove you have a risk factor. Under these guidelines, the color of your skin is considered a risk factor. So the non-white person gets the treatment. The white person has a hurdle that he or she has to jump over, which is you have to prove something specific to yourself. So they're, by imposing a standard on one race that is not imposed on another, that violates the Equal Protection Clause of the Constitution. They can't do that. Now, I have to say that I was surprised when I heard that New York was actually doing this. When I heard Donald Trump say it, I actually didn't think that it was true. Um, and, you know, the way he phrased it, putting that aside. But the reality is that th the way that they defend it, as you know, and you just mentioned this, is they say that the rational reason, the rational basis for it is when you look at how many more people of color are dying, hospitalized, et cetera, uh, from COVID, that based on the numbers, that becomes a risk factor. What do you say to that? But it's not a risk factor for a specific person. Just because, for argument's sake, the African com American community may have higher rates of diabetes or something like that that make them more at risk from COVID doesn't mean that this specific patient has diabetes. So when you're dealing with something you have to ration that's in short supply, you have to make choices. And you're making the choice solely based on somebody being a member of a community, not that specific person's condition. And again, I get back to the example. Two people walk in, the only difference in who gets eligibility is skin color. And that should not be acceptable. You know, and I did think that the state's response where they said nobody's been denied treatment based on their race was, you know, a little bit of a bait and switch game there because, you know, that's not the question, right, that's being asked as a legal matter. They're, they're saying as a practical matter, that's what's happened as of today, but that doesn't really address the legal question. No, it doesn't address the uh, equal protection argument. And it's something that, frankly, is probably unknowable at this point, unless sure. uh, somebody applied for it, tried to get it, didn't get it, and comes forward, we wouldn't know. So we don't really know the answer to that. They're asserting something that's uh, non-provable at this point, but it doesn't matter legally. Legally, they can't apply different standards to different races. All right, I'm gonna ask you to put your law professor hat on now. Um, I know how you feel about this. I know what you think should happen. You think you're gonna win? Well, I, I never predict a court case. Uh, most of the time, really? I'm not a claim. Even as a I'm law not, professor? Not, Come on, well, that's I, what I law try, professors do. They to. make guesses, they make predictions, <laughs> they, they say what it should be, and it should, yeah, come on, play with us. Well, I can tell you what it should be. I can tell you what it should I be. I know that. This should not stand, but what a court will do, I, I literally don't predict because things are too unpredictable, but I think we have a very strong case. I think it, it on its face, applying different standards to different races is so outrageous. I'm actually shocked they're defending it. Yeah, I, I have to say I am too. I was stunned that this is actually in the law. And I think you probably do have a pretty strong case here. We shall see. Um, Professor Jacobson, thank you so much for coming on the show. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Coming up, a man racing down a ski slope hits a five-year-old girl taking a ski lesson on a bunny trail. He killed her. Now he's facing a manslaughter charge. That's like
If you're a parent who's ever gone skiing with your child, you know you worry about them falling, veering off the trail, potentially hitting trees, goofing around too much on the lift. But you expect them to be safe when they're taking a ski lesson on the bunny slope. So this story is the stuff of parental nightmares. A little girl taking ski lessons at a resort in France died over the weekend after an out-of-control skier crashed into her. He's now being charged with manslaughter. It happened Saturday morning at the Flen Ski Resort in the French Alps. Prosecutors say the five-year-old was lined up single file with a group of about four other kids and their instructor. She was about to turn when the speeding skier slammed into her. He was apparently going so fast he couldn't stop and they both wiped out. The little girl went into cardiac arrest. She died in the helicopter on the way to the hospital. Can't even imagine how the parents found out. It was their British nationals, a local mayor of the resort town where they were vacationing, was looking for an English-speaking psychologist for them, describing the parents as an extreme shock. Prosecutors say the 40-year-old man who hit the girl is a local volunteer firefighter and a regular at the resort, meaning he's an experienced skier. His name is not being released, but authorities in France say the guy was going way too fast, speeding down the easiest slope. The resort telling us today, quote, the investigation is underway to find out the exact circumstances of the tragic accident. Joining me now from Paris is criminal defense attorney Dominique Mondoloni. Dominique, thank you very much for coming on the show. We appreciate it. Um, talk to us about the law in France, about what prosecutors will have to prove with regard to a manslaughter charge. Well, manslaughter under French law is much more, uh, it's, 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 uh, it, it, it only requires that you demonstrate that somebody has uh, not respected uh, um, rules that apply. Otherwise, recklessness is manslaughter. There's no intent. Intent is not an issue. Um, manslaughter is uh, recklessness, recklessness, carelessness. So when you're driving down the slope and you're going at 90 an hour, that's reckless. Right. Now, do you think that the fact that the guy was tried to render first aid at the scene, will it all help him? Well, maybe ultimately it might help him, but nonetheless, the offense is committed. I mean, when you're, when you're, French criminal law is very much focused on uh, the offended. And so it might work for him in the sense that it might defend him. But when you look at, yeah. When you look yeah. at the, the sheer facts. All right. All right. Yeah. All right. D Dominique, thank you very much for coming on the show. We appreciate it. Au yeah. revoir. Um, coming up, yeah. this isn't something you see every day, a police chase involving a backhoe, and the guy behind the wheel is ready to ram into anything, homes, cars, nothing's off limits. This insane body cam is up next. We're on scene tonight with the Vineland, New Jersey Police Department showing the dangers that officers face every day. It starts with a 911 call as a man drove a backhoe through the parking lot of a packaging company. What's going on, sir? Well, I don't, he's coming out the door, it looks like, with the backhoe. So he's trying to hit the building? That's what it looked like. Everyone just ran inside. Um... I don't know what this guy's doing. The suspect, Joshua Gonzalez, left the parking lot and drove the machine onto a road. He smashed a car with the driver inside as she was on her way to work. In newly released video from the New Jersey Attorney General's office, we see what happened as police tried to comfort the driver.
police officer in that car that was just struck. Six, negative, it's my vehicle. 29 and 826 have been totaled. Are you all right? No, I'm in shock. Okay, I'm going to work. All right, come back to me. We're going to have you this. sit down, okay? Gonzalez destroyed two police cars. He also flipped an ambulance as he drove into yards and damaged homes. The rampage went on for 30 minutes. Police were able to catch up to Gonzalez at a cul-de-sac. Canine officer parked a block away to keep the dog safe, responded and fired at the suspect, hitting him. But the backhoe was still running with Gonzalez slumped onto the gas pedal. The machine knocked down a street light and got tangled in a tree. Officers jumped into the cab and powered down the excavator. Police gave Gonzalez CPR, but he was pronounced dead at the scene. Three officers suffered minor injuries. No one in any of the homes was hurt. The state attorney general's office is investigating. Joining me as always, Sean Sticks Larkin, former Tulsa police lieutenant. You know, Sticks, this is the sort of thing we might have seen on Live PD back in the day when we were following uh, police departments in real time, and there always seemed to be these crazy events happening, but it just does show you that uh, you can never predict what a police officer is going to have to face any day they go to work. Yeah, absolutely. You know, talk about on Live PD, uh, it's funny you bring that up. I think one of the most memorable pursuits that was on there was a stolen school bus. And, you know, it was a kid that yeah. led, uh, led officers on a lengthy one. And one of the problems for us in law enforcement, when you're chasing a big vehicle like this, how do you stop it? Um, you know, the good thing about this, it was 530 in the morning. People, uh, you know, really weren't out other than the one female that was hit uh, by the by the by the backhoe. But it, it's a problem. You can't do a pit maneuver. You can't put spike strips down. And another thing about this video that stands out to me, this is why it's so important for the public, for the media, for, for other law enforcement officers to see the whole story, look at all the different videos, their cell phone videos, surveillance videos, body cam videos, of what happened on this. Um, because you look at it, it looks like this vehicle is just out doing property damage and officers use deadly force to stop it. And in fact, he's chased occupied police cars. He's hit an occupied vehicle. He's crashing into houses where people are sleeping, you know, things like that. It's uh, this, this guy needed to be stopped. Context, 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 which a lot of the time we don't get in the media. Um, the suspect uh, terrorized a driver on her way to work. Let's see what happened again as one officer got out of her car to help the woman. <laughs> Yeah, look, it is clear, Sticks, that this guy would have still hit that police car even if there was someone inside. Yeah, exactly. Actually, this video continues on. There is a police vehicle that's act, uh, out there blocking traffic, stopping, that is occupied. And the, the suspect drives right at him. So the, the officer actually has to do a U-turn and take off. He's being pursued by the backhoe just to avoid getting you know run over or flipped over himself. And then after the police shoot him, I, they must at that point realize that you know, the, the vehicle is not stopping, so they have to get in there and try to turn the machine off. Yeah, exactly. You know, I've never been inside of a backhoe. Yes, I live in Oklahoma. We're a little country, <laughs> uh, but yeah. I'm hoping it's something as simple as just turning a key. Uh, but, you know, all seriousness aside, I mean, the guy was slumped over on there. His foot was still uh, on the gas pedal. You can hear it accelerating. So they do have to get in there, get the vehicle stopped, um, you know, try to render aid to the, uh, to the suspect. Yeah. All right. Well, seems that uh, we had a, a more thorough conversation here than my last segment. We had a little extra time as a result uh, of that. But I have never seen, I will say, a backhoe involved in a situation like this. And it does make you think about the kind, different kinds of vehicles 
that someone could be in that would create dangers to a community and dangers to police officers. Yeah, absolutely. You know, there's some famous videos out there of somebody actually in a stolen tank uh, several years ago, I think in Southern California, there's people who have stolen mobile homes. Um, there's people who have stolen ambulances, buses, things like that. So it, it does create a huge problem for those of us in law enforcement trying to protect the public and get these guys stopped. Sean Larkin, good to see you. Thanks for coming on. Thank you, Dan. You know, we want to hear from you, the viewers. One thing we haven't done in a while that I want to do again soon is we want to have some of you zoom in live to talk about one of the topics that we've been covering. We, we covered a lot of hot, sort of controversial topics tonight. Tell me what I'm getting right. What am I getting wrong? Newsnationnow.com slash DAL. Come on in. Debate me. Discuss with me. Tell me how great I am, or more likely, tell me how wrong I am. That does it for us tonight. News Nation Prime with Marty Hughes starts right now. Thank you for watching. Click the red subscribe button below so you can get more of News Nation's fact-driven, unbiased coverage.